meeting of the Budget and Finance Committee for Monday, April 7th, 2014. I'm Paul Krikorian, Chair of the Committee. I'm joined by my colleagues, Council Members Blumenfield, Englander, and Koretz, and we are uh, ready to begin. Members, we're, we have a, uh, a lengthy agenda today, and uh, what I'd like to do is propose a few items for consent, and let's see if we can do a few of those at the um, outset. On the closed session items, uh, if there's no objection, I would propose uh, approving the recommendations on items one, three, and four on consent. One and three are recommendations of the city attorney to approve settlements. Item four is uh, noting and filing of the status of liability accounts uh, report, unless there's questions or concerns about those matters. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. We can do that. All right, so then um, without objection, item three, the recommendation will be approved without objection. Uh, item four will be noted and filed without objection. Item one, uh, we don't need to go into closed session. We can conduct that uh, vote um, in open session. And the recommendation is to approve the uh, outside council's recommendation of settlement. So all in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so that uh, passes by a three to one vote with Mr. Englander uh, voting no. Uh, Chairman, on number one, I'm Craig Miller from the city attorney's office, present with uh, Lisa Collinson. There'd be one technical correction we'd like to make to the report. The, uh, and Dolores Can you make that an open session? Yes. Okay. Um, just Go ahead. The payee line should be changed from those law firms and the plaintiff to just Olu K. Orange Client Trust Fund account. Okay. Very good. Just make sure that that's provided to the clerk in writing so we get the names right. And uh, without objection, our action will be uh, so amended. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So we'll come back, members, then to items number two and five in closed session at the end of today's agenda. Um, I would also propose items, items, members, I'd, I'd recommend items six, eight, nine, and ten uh, for approval of the recommendations uh, on consent. Item six, the recommendation is receive and file. Um, items eight and ten. Uh, we would be approving the recommendation, the staff recommendations, and item nine is a note and file. Unless there's objections, questions, or concerns on those matters. Eight, nine, and ten. Six, eight, nine, and ten. Mm -hmm. Okay. So without objection, it will be the action of the committee to uh, so approve, note and file, and receive and file. <laughs> and that brings us to item 13, which I would propose as a cons for consent approval uh, so long as the applicant still pays all appropriate fees and receive all appropriate permits. But with that um, one proviso, we do have a card, but if there... Oh, and actually, they're not indicated as for or against. So, Mr. Simarusti, are you? Four. You're for? Okay, so as I've indicated, um, I'd like to have that approved on consent, um, but let's see if there's any objection to that first. Okay, so we'll go ahead and hear that, that matter, um, but not yet. Sorry, Mr. Simarusti. So we've dealt with six, eight, nine, ten. Actually, they're, they're at the elevator. Sorry? The controller's All right, let's go ahead and hear number 13 now. So, uh, Mr. Simarusti, why don't I ask you to come on forward, please, and provide your comments. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> what information do you need from me? Name? Name, address? 
Ralph. That's fine. just your name and, and your comments are fine. I, I really don't have any comments. I mean, we, the only issue is we would uh, block a block a street has there's a moratorium on, on the because of the repaving. We have to go two feet into block a street in order to do this, which would make the process considerably simpler versus going into Manchester, which would be just a horrific process. Okay. Um, we unfortunately, Mr. Bonin is not here to discuss this matter, but do we have uh, anybody who's been working on this project with Mr. Bonin's staff or anybody else from staff who can respond to Mr. Englander's questions? Is there anybody from Street Services that can talk to it? <clears throat> I don't believe anybody's opposed. Oh, okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ron Oliver with Street Services. Um, I'm aware of the project. I'm aware of, you know, the notification we provided, the resurfacing work we did back in September. Um, beyond that, um, you know, I can, I can tell you this has been a, a past practice to the wave them under uh, approved motion, but other than that, it's a policy decision. I don't have any recommendation for you either way. I was just looking for, there's no report on the actual street itself. Do we have a report on, um, was this a street that was reconstructed, repaired, or slurry sealed in the last No, it was year? resurfaced back in September. So it was a, just a res yes, a resurfacing project. I believe the, the, the length of the street was roughly a half a mile long from, uh, from Manchester to Arbor uh, I can never pronounce it, Arbor Vitae, um, on Belonk Avenue. It's roughly about a half a mile long stretch. I don't know if the cut is needed in the intersection. The ordinance requires the intersection get resurfaced if it's just a cut in the intersection. But if it's in the street itself, um, between those limits, then the ordinance does say you have we to. We have a report on the actual work that's be there's not there's nothing attached except for the motion. I, I have pictures we're literally cutting into well, but okay, I mean, no, I'm I'm sorry, officially from, the, from the city any any all I really have is a the notice of street work that was sent out to all of the the proper owners on record on that street that was it there was nothing that's, that, that's correct and it was noted as a resourcing project so I and, and, and I know we we typically um, do these and have done them and I haven't but we they've, they've been done historically in the past to try to be a little more business friendly and help businesses because it's so cost prohibitive um, in looking at and doing a deep dive in the streets and a lot that, that I've been working on. Uh, just to let you know, one of the things that uh, we're moving forward with as well is a five-year, not a one-year, but a five-year moratorium on cutting into streets, not just a one-year because it ruins the integrity and the life of the street, if it's particularly if it's not, not repaired right. Without knowing the full history of that particular street, um, and knowing when it was, what was actually done, and at what cost, and, and where things are at now, um, I, I, I'm, I'm inclined not not to support it. Not not because, uh, and I typically would always go along with with the council member of the district. But I just have concern um, over that practice and the fact that we've been working uh, on another front with contract administration as well, and um, a lot of these folks that don't don't repair it correctly or. Um, in working with vendors. Do we know, know which vendors are actually doing the work? Do we have any of that information at all? Oh, um, Bureau of Street Services um, uh, forces did the work, all of the, all of the resourcing work. We did the resourcing yes. work. Yes, it was, part of, the, it was part of the annual resourcing program. Right, who's going to be cutting into it to do it now? Um, we, we would. We are the developer and we're the construction company as well. Yeah. We do a lot, of, a lot of development in the city of Los Angeles. It would be... You doing the street work? Yes. Yes, and we've done a lot of street work in the city of Los Angeles. It would be a horribly difficult situation to go across Man Manchester and do the repairs, okay, I get you know, that. circumvent traffic and so on. And when, when was the actual work done? When was it completed? Uh, September of 2013. And how long had it been since that street was resurfaced prior to that? Unfortunately, Councilman, I, I'm sorry, I don't have that information. Okay. Were these, it, has this matter already been considered by the Public Works Committee? It's waived. It's waived. Okay. So the chair of the Public Works Committee waived this, this matter out. My concern here is really the, the uh, fiscal impacts of it. Uh, Mr. Kretz. Well, uh, as long as we have this uh, item before us, I think it's, it's probably worth discussing because half of the problem when this is done is, is the quality of work is very sporadic. So we've all seen streets that look okay and you see a cut in like this and it's done badly and the, the street's now now not a, a very well maintained street and you could do the same thing and do it as perfectly as possible and the harm would be relatively modest so 
my question is when we approve these, how careful are we to make sure that a, a great job is done on the repair? The Bureau of Engineering actually requires what they call a T-section repair, which is um, uh, something more than a, than a standard repair, but more, uh, more involved. It's, it's a, uh, you know, it, it's five feet on either side, and it's a, a good structural repair, but again, as has been mentioned, once you cut into the street, now you don't have a, you know, a, a single structure anymore. It's always going to be a weak, weak spot there. It's always, always going to be a source of, um, you know, potential water infiltration. The sub base is not going to be as supportive as the surrounding area, what have you. So no matter how good a repair you do, it's never going to be as it was when it was resurfaced as one. Well, look, I'll admit, I have no expertise in this area, but I've seen these repairs done over the years. Um, can I address that? And, one? and, and you, can, you can tell a perfect repair. It's perfectly level. They use some sort of slurry material on the edges. Uh, and, and you know it's going to be better than one where you just slop some asphalt in. And I think we've probably seen the gamut in terms of those kinds of repairs uh, done both by the city and private contractors. So... Uh, the question is, how can we make sure that the best possible job is can I, done? Can I address that point? Actually, no, um, because this is uh, this discussion is, is beyond the scope of the agenda item. So, thank you that we're talking about general uh, city policy. Uh, well, I'm also talking about this agenda item too. I mean, but but it's a more general question. How do we make sure that this job is done perfectly so the least harm to a new street is is caused. The the Bureau of Engineering, I think, it also mentioned the motion, and as, as the chair also added to the conditions, um, when the permit's issued, it, there's actually a special order under the Bureau of Engineering that has the design already laid out what the repair has to be done to what standard. So engineering will permit it to that, and the Bureau of Contract Administration will inspect to make sure it's done for that design that's already been established for these uh, cuts into newly reserved streets. Okay. So, members, I'm going to propose this. Since members have uh, specific questions about this and we don't have a, a report and it was waived by Public Works, I think in fairness, I'd like to have uh, Mr. Bonin be here uh, when we bring this matter up. So if we can hold this in uh, committee then, unless, unless if you're comfortable, members, in, in moving it forward so we can resolve our questions bef between now and council, that would be fine. Otherwise, if you would like to ask further questions, I'd like Mr. Bonin to be here for that. So um, we can... Hold it in committee or move it forward with uh, comments so, noted and does it can we ask whether it harms the project by that delay is there anything time sensitive mr simmers absolutely about, about it would we would if we didn't get this settled today we have to shut the project down and there are tenants there well you're not going to get it settled today because it's going to move we forward have to, we have it's going to move project. forward to city council no matter what we do today but at least we know that there's on the track of approval um and, and the issue that just if i could just address the comment about it's our property and we are the end user of the property. Uh, it will be our development. So we're, we wouldn't want, you know, shoddy ingress, egress on the property. So it would be fixed properly. And, of course, along with all the city code. Uh, council member, this may be going a little beyond the, uh, the scope of the agenda. So I would recommend that um, uh, you put it off until uh, an appropriate notice be, be provided to the public. Uh, okay. Well, I, I think it's... And we're fine. We're, we're, we're within the context. If, given the time-sensitive nature of it, um, I would ask that we move the the matter forward then, and then uh, at the time of council, we can discuss any of these matters uh, further, or members can uh, speak separately with Mr. Bonin prior to to then about his uh, why he moved, moved this forward. But. Uh, I'm going to propose that we go ahead and move forward I, then. I do have a question, though, just okay. a legal one. If we can get an opinion when it comes to council as well, um, I, would, I would suggest we send this to council with no vote. So it moves on without a recommendation from this committee, but ask the CLA to wave in on it, whether we even have the authority, because I'm not sure we do, to actually waive these or not. Um, if it's agendized correctly as setting aside city policy, if we have that authority without going to the Board of Public the commission as well. I'm not sure if this went through commission. Um, but if we can ask the CLA to waive, to bring that before we vote on this. It's been waived out of one committee, so there hasn't been a vote on it yet. Um, and I think it is under the purview of this community to look at it from a financial perspective of what's being done correctly, what work is not being done correctly, the history of that. We've got um, roughly, you know, $3 billion backlog in, in failed streets. It, 
we start getting into the financials of it, it's very much under purview of this committee. But having said that, and without going into it, I think we should ask um, what abilities and ask the CLA to weigh in on the uh, if we, in fact, can do these or not. And that way we move it on, don't keep it in here, it doesn't hold up the project, moves on to council. We can actually get some more information about this before we vote on it. If the chairman's comfortable with that. I have no, I'm always comfortable with asking more questions. So that's, uh, that'd be fine. We can have that reported back at the time of council, but uh, we'll go ahead and advance this out, move it uh, towards council on the um, expectation that our public works chair made the decision to waive it um, with an understanding that those issues might uh, uh, be raised, but um, he chose to waive it, so I'm comfortable with, with that. But we can certainly ask the question uh, prior to council. Is there any objection to advancing no. it forward with the understanding that those questions will be answered at the time of uh, council vote? For without a vote? Huh? Is it without a vote? He said? No, no, I'm going to, I'm, I'm I, then I, recommending approval of the motion. I, I would rather stay here. Okay. Uh, I'd recommend just moving it forward with no recommendation. Can we do that? Okay. Uh, so we really have enough to base it on. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and move that we approve the motion. Uh, all in favor of that say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. So um, those, if, if you'd like to, are you supportive of that? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So then that will advance on a three to one vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Okay, so that brings us then to uh, I did I think I saw the controller. Yes. Is the controller here? <laughs> so. All right, let's go ahead and uh, call item number seven. I think the controller is here in the room someplace. Item number seven, please. There it goes. Mr. Controller, welcome. Thank it's you. It's good very to much. have you back here before a committee on this issue that's been of great interest to all of us for some time now. And thank you for your good work and um, providing much greater depth of analysis in, in this review. Um, this has been here before the committee a few times, and uh, we're pleased to have you back as we move forward even more. And if you, I see you have a screen set up, so yes, uh, take it away. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Krikorian, uh, members of the committee, and uh, thank you so much for uh, having me here today, for having us here today, and for your focus on this very important subject of the uh, special funds. Um, as we know, much attention is paid, of course, to the city's general fund and budget, but a significant portion of the city's spending and funds on hand is in its 974, that's out of the last count, special purpose funds. Um, together, these special funds constitute an overwhelming 89% of the city's $8.9 billion in cash assets as of December 31st, 2013, which is in the Treasury. Um, I really want to just begin very much by uh, thanking the uh, CAO and the CAO's office for uh, having been a, uh, a great partner in this and uh, in uh, the work that we have done together to put all of this together. Uh, it's interesting, the community often asks what are special funds and why do we have so many of them? And uh, in, in many ways it, it seems to me as if somebody, for example, has a, a variety of sources of income, many different accounts, and then tries to go to the grocery store with a thousand different checkbooks. One which they can only buy tomatoes with, another which they can only go buy uh, oranges with, and on and on and on. Um, but uh, it, it sort of highlights the complexities of managing these uh, nearly 1,000 different uh, funds and keeping track of them and really using them to their uh, best and uh, most efficient purposes. And of course, this really became very important last year when $42.6 million had accumulated since 1996 in one of the city's special funds, which was the Transportation Grant Fund. And uh, the money sat idle for quite a long period of time. And I think a very big part of why you're doing this is really to see that that does not happen again. Uh, I think one can't help but ask, how did that happen? And it's been something of an accounting and uh, an administrative mess, dare I say. Uh, in compiling this information, 
uh, about the 974 funds from disparate departments and offices in the city. This has been really long overdue, and it turned out to be a very labor-intensive job. A good deal of the information actually for many of these older funds was found in hard copy paper files, uh, often on onion skin paper, uh, found in 71 fund binders dating back to the 1930s. Uh, our office went through these and began to manually input the information to create the first ever comprehensive spreadsheet of these funds. Uh, we also asked the departments to verify the amounts uh, that are now put up there. Uh, also to fill in missing information on the current status of funds and to identify funds that were missing or do not belong to them. Having said this, this is a work in progress. It needs to constantly be updated. And there are also uh, a number of entries that have been made that still require a lot of follow-up by us as to uh, their veracity. Uh, but having said that, this hopefully will provide a really good basis for being able to dig deeper into uh, the various funds and look at the ones that have the greatest risks, the greatest opportunities, etc. Um, in putting this together, there are 40 columns of data uh, which now can be found online. There's also, uh, I think you might have co hard copies as well, although they're a little bit uh, rather thick to go through on paper, but they include information on fund purposes, sources of revenue, the eligible uses, the balances, grants information, and I'll talk a little bit more about grants in a few moments, uh, assets and liabilities, uh, links to ordinances and governing documents which previously did not exist. We actually worked a lot with the city clerk and loaded up all of the uh, various links so that you now can, can click on that, as well as uh, administrator information. And so we're just going to quickly walk through this online, and what we, we sought to do is to, rather than have the unwieldy spreadsheet to kind of highlight some of the most important things, I'm going to focus on six of them real briefly in terms of the ways in which you can search. Uh, by name, by category, third is by department, the fourth is by word, fifth is by dollars, and sixth is by reimbursements. So let's start out with actually the first, which is sort of the most uh, simple, and you can see here you can just search by the name of any particular fund. You can also search by number of that fund. Uh, category, and there are actually about 22 different categories, and you'll see this is a, a view of a pie chart. What we did is we put this into the Socrata format, and many of you have seen this before for uh, other types of data sets that we put up uh, through the control panel, but this is a whole new set of data and a whole new way of looking at it. And you'll see that uh, they're broken up into uh, general government, into transportation, uh, et cetera. So let, let's... Bigger, pardon me, sure. Can you make it a little bigger? Is there any way? Is it possible to make it a little bit bigger? Um, I can't read. might also help to dim the light slightly, but I don't know if that's possible or not. I don't think we have dimmers. So we have a... Uh, ah, that's much better. So, for example, we have a, a category for police, fire, and 911 facilities. And you can click on that, and you can actually see all the various uh, underlying funds that fall into that kind of category, go into the detail on them. We have one for street services. And you can see the cash balance, but then you can go into that and see many more details as well. One for rec and parks. Oh, did you click on that one? Let's see. Aha, there we go. And then depending upon the speed of the internet, which I know that Council Member Blumenfield was uh, working on today <laughs> for Citywide, uh, and there, there are uh, then, that's a pie chart view, but there are other ways to kind of go and see each and every single one of the funds. Uh, you can also search by department. And let's have a look at controller and the funds that are through the controller's office. And you can just type in controller. We really do need faster service in this building. <laughs> um, well, suffice it to say that uh, you, can, you can get to uh, each and every one of the various departments. You can also do a word search by typing in grant or by typing in park. 
And then you can also view it by dollars, and uh, that can be by cash balances, by ending fund balances, and a, a whole variety of other ways that you can rank these in dollar terms. The reason that this is important is because, quite frankly, I would love to be able to uh, audit each and every one of these 970-plus uh, funds. I, I would be deceiving everybody if I said that that was actually possible. But this helps us to sort of identify, and we really uh, want to get your input on those which you think are, are most worthy of, of having a good look into. There's also columns that we have for reimbursements to the general fund. And there's one column that asked each and every one of the uh, departments, are you reimbursing the general fund? There uh, were 225 uh, funds for which the answer was yes. Then we had another question for, can you reimburse the general fund? And turns out that there are 46 who said, yes, they can, but have not been doing so. Now, there can be a whole variety of reasons for that, and, and we're going to be spending time uh, looking into that with greater depth. Some of that may be because council asked them not to. Some of that may be because they don't have the money to do so. But it's, it's the next area of inquiry. And then, of course, there are those who maybe did not report that they can or should be reimbursing the general fund, but who may nonetheless still need to be doing so, uh, even though they were not self-reporting. And that's part of the, one of the next phases in what we're going to be looking at. Uh, again, as I said, this is going to be uh, updated uh, on a regular basis, uh, so this is really kind of a snapshot in time. Uh, the vast majority of these special funds, about 90%, are so-called off-budget, and that's something I think that this uh, committee will want to really consider what can be done to perhaps either bring more on-budget or, or find some mechanisms to uh, uh, best look at the uh, monies going in and out of them. And uh, dozens of funds, obviously, are being opened and closed in any given year. And uh, typically, we've seen uh, more opened than closed. But we've identified a great many that we would like to see closed uh, in the next couple of months. And uh, we are working with those departments to make sure that happens, just so that we can kind of clean it out. There's some that still have a few dollars left. And, and we want to make sure that the accounting is cleaned up so that that can be done. Recommendations moving forward. Um, Given the magnitude of both the number of the special funds and the assets, we really believe that a citywide coordinated effort is critical to ensuring proper management and oversight of the funds. And also prioritizing regular reporting uh, is key to effective management of these funds. Uh, number one, let me focus on grants management. And uh, we, we are actually looking to utilize a consultant in the controller's office to produce a blueprint for grants management and for centralization and also to work with the CAO on this uh, because it's, uh, it, it's absolutely vital and uh, can be helpful to the city in many number of ways. Uh, there's also a, a module that can be added to the FMS which uh, uh, would be uh, potentially quite useful when it comes to uh, grants management and the county invested in this. The city has uh, yet to do so, it's my understanding. Uh, we are also looking to uh, conduct a more in-depth analysis of various special funds as part of our uh, audit work plan. We've identified a number of what those would be. We have a variety of criteria, but quite frankly, there are limited resources and we can only go into so many of them. Um, we are going to be implementing an intake form to capture key information on new funds uh, and to have that information available uh, in the system so that some of the problems that have occurred in the past do not occur in the future. And uh, there's also really a great need to work with each and every one of the departments and to, quite frankly, uh, assist them in their accounting to provide the resources that they need accounting-wise and the resources that we in the controller's office need so that we can, we can help them with that because the absence thereof, I think, has really been manifest in... Uh, numbers being put in that are often inaccurate or in the wrong column or uh, uh, skewing of the numbers in a way that just really didn't make a lot of sense. And um, with that, I just want to again really say thank you to uh, my staff uh, that has worked incredibly hard for months to put this together, actually, uh, digging information out that, that uh, 
really was not easily or readily available. And wanted to very much thank the CAO and the CAO's office for uh, for your partnership and for uh, your work on this uh, very important uh, report and all that will come uh, from it, hopefully as well. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Galper. Mr. Santana, anything that you'd like to add? No, I, I think the controller did a, a great job <clears throat> summarizing the main issues and. Um, they really took the lead on on this very complex assignment, and you know there's there's no um, uh, pot of gold yet. I think everyone was hoping that we would find a, a large sum of, of money, and we haven't done so. Uh, but this is an important process that we should continue on uh, as we move forward. Okay. Well, and and I want to speak to that pot of gold issue a minute because sometimes this. Um, this whole issue of the special funds has been misunderstood, I think. And uh, it's important to take a step back and talk about why we launched this effort. And that was um, a general interest in providing a greater degree of transparency to something that's been very obscured. And as the controller, I think, very well articulated, some of this stuff goes back so long that there isn't even anybody at the city who really remembers why uh, these things were created. And so, so our oversight system has been badly broken and the transparency on the special funds has, has been poor. Um, then we had the situation with the Department of Transportation um, identifying $42 million in reimbursements that were owed to the general fund sometimes been misreported. It wasn't that $42 million was found. It wasn't sitting in a bank account someplace or in one of these accounts and just no one knew it was there. It was a matter that it had been misaccounted. It, it, the reimbursement was owed. The money wasn't found. There was reimbursement that was owed to the general fund. And only by having the kinds of tools that the controller has created here will we be able to really make sure that going forward nothing like that ever happens because all of this will be susceptible to audit and oversight in a way that we haven't previously experienced. So um, I want to thank you, Mr. Galperin, too, for uh, listening to all the recommendations that this committee had for how to make this a, a more thorough and robust tool. And that seems to all have been implemented in what you have here. And so I really appreciate that. Um, the one thing that I, I want to stress is um, with these 970 funds, uh, we can really lose the forest for the trees. And I think you made a, an important point about you can't, I mean, we don't have the resources to necessarily go and audit every one of these right away. So we really need to, in very short order, identify the highest priority areas for further research and analysis and audit. And I would, um, I'm certain that that will already be part of your ongoing work with, with the CAO's office. Um, and in terms of uh, closing these funds, uh, you, you've, you already have recommendations for those that you would propose to be closed where the cost of maintaining them is probably greater than the amount that's contained in them, I, I assume. So we, yes. You, you've well, more than 100, actually, that we've identified right now. Uh, and uh, we, we want to make sure that, that everything is in place to do that. Great. And then the one piece of this larger puzzle that we have talked about in committee that hasn't fully been implemented yet, understandably, is um, identifying the reimbursement obligations that are owed to the general fund. And as I understand it, that's a far more complex task than we uh, might, than any of us might have thought going in, because there may in fact be situations where uh, the obligation goes in both directions, that yes. there may be situations where the general fund may be subject to a reimbursement obligation to a special fund for some reason. And so as you're moving forward, you're, you're evaluating that and you will be um, completing that investigation as to all of these funds as well, I gather. And there's also, by the way, uh, uh, reimbursements as to particular activities, but there's also the potential for reimbursement when it comes to the uh, interest that is uh, earned uh, where there may be interest earned on a uh, on a particular set of, uh, of uh, monies. So what will be the plan going forward to make those determinations and to prioritize them to the areas where they're most likely to achieve significant results? Well, we're in uh, the process of uh, following up with each of those uh, funds that were identified as being potential for uh, reimbursements 
but are not making those, those 46. Mm -hmm. And we'll have a better sense of uh, what the reasons are and, and what might or might not be happening there. But it actually takes a pretty deep dive into them in order to find that out. I'm sure. Okay. Uh, anything, members? Mr. Kretz. Um, how far back is an obligation to reimburse the general fund? If there's a fund that has had an obligation to reimburse us for 30 years and has never done it, how far back do we go? Do we just go to the current year? Are we allowed to go back a certain prescribed number of years? What's the, what's the rule? Each, each fund would have its own sort of uh, parameters around that specific question. In the case of transportation, they went pretty far back. So part of, part of the analysis is for me, what are the rules around that fund? Um, what is eligible for reimbursement? Uh, sometime the parameters are about what could be reimbursed is based on council policy. So there's certain bond programs, for example, where it's based on council policy that there <coughs> shouldn't be a full reimbursement. Uh, we have to make sure that we honor that. Um, and then ultimately what are the specific restrictions are. So it's, it, there's not one simple answer to that question because each fund is different. And how does it work if you find that you had a fund because it's in a file on uh, a hard copy from 40 years ago? Uh, where is that money actually? And was it tracked in any way? How do you separate it out and, and pull it back and use it for something? We allow with the controller's office. If you have a fund that was set up, council usually authorizes the fund, unless it's a proprietary department. And therefore, when the fund is set up, there is a separate fund number that's tracking the money coming in, as well as the money that's being spent from it. So that's not commingled in any way. But that's true even if we weren't really focused on it and aware of it until we ran across a piece of paper in a file somewhere. Well, the fund binders that we were referring to, the pieces of papers that's in that binder, with every paper that's put in the binder, a fund number is established for it. So, but we never had a list of those fund numbers previously. Yes, we did in our financial management system. So we knew we knew they existed and the amounts that we, but we didn't know what they were. What what didn't we know that we now know? Our financial management system provides financial data. It doesn't provide necessarily fund information data. For example, the eligible use, where the money comes from, is all financial data. So that's why what, you, what you're seeing when you go into the OFMIS and FMS is just financial records, which we're required to keep. But the rest of the stuff, the more somewhat interesting stuff to the public of what I can use that for is what we've put together here in this report. Including governing documents, including uh, uh, links to uh, council files, et cetera. So that was all on paper before. Mm -hmm. so, so in other words, these might be a somewhat disembodied fund. We knew we had it, but we didn't know exactly what it was for and what it could be used for, whether it could be uh, sent back to the general fund or, or other, right. other possibilities. I don't know, by the way, that they were necessarily disembodied, but, but rather uh, one of the problems that, that can occur when the original governing documents and when reference to council files is not readily linked is that the money uh, could be spent for something that uh, it didn't get spent for or that uh, it got spent for something that it really should not have been spent for. So this is really a way to kind of safeguard that and also to make sure that the uh, opportunities uh, will be more fully uh, realized and capitalized on. Mr. England. Thank you. I, I got it. My hat's off to you. So this is, um, I, I'm just doing a deep dive here and I've actually gone through it already. I can go through this four or five times and it gets even more exciting every time I go through it. Uh, thank you for your, in your entire office and your team that, is, that has put this together. This is a good launching off point to do a deep dive and a look at some of these. Um, and, and I know this is something not only that you said day one that you were going to do, um, but you said throughout your campaign that you were actually going to do it. And, you, and you're doing it. <clears throat> and I want to thank you and, and as well as Miguel and your entire team um, of the controller's office working with the CAO's, CAO's office. It's incredible. And looking at some of these 
quite frankly, um, funds that were established in the 70s and the 80s that were archived on, on paper, as you said, mm -hmm. at best, in two boxes. Who knows what kind of format <laughs> they were in. Um, blue binders. Blue binders. Binders. Um, and, and while I, I understand and I, and I think it's important to share with folks that we didn't just suddenly find three and a half billion dollars that could be used um, and we can restore the fire department and pave every street and uh, do all the things that we hope to do. These are very restricted in terms of their use and their, and I think you started off, uh, quite frankly, um, your analogy was, was spot on, saying it's, it's, it's like going to the grocery store with a hundred different checkbooks and every single checkbook has to buy only one particular thing. In fact, I think you've got other things in here that are beyond checkbooks. Um, debt service funds were yes. also broken out and um, that's something else we didn't have a, this kind of level of detail connected to the originating documents and proprietary funds, which were also in here. Um, although I don't know that there are any fund balances, I guess we'll be working with the proprietary departments uh, to get those, but harbor, water, and power, looking at some of those uh, special funds and, and uh, what, what they've got as well. Some of these are, um, are so old that, that they, those programs could be long gone. Yes. Which, you know, uh, prioritizing, as Mr. Kikorian said, looking at where do we start and looking at those priorities from perhaps the least amount of activity or ones that have been sitting the longest, not necessarily fund balances, but if, if it hasn't had any activity for 20 years, there's probably a good chance somebody doesn't know about it. <laughs> uh, because I think everybody, certainly in this building, has looked at it under every seat cushion for, for every a possible piece of loose change that they can get to keep the city afloat. And um, in looking at this, the initial research just from last year in the transportation funds, that was 42 million, um, roughly. That, that was from one special, from one special fund. Uh, really was an eye-opener to say, let's, let's look at all of these, and particularly the management of them. And this, is, this is definitely a much better good start than, than I think any of us could hope for. So. Appreciate it. Well, thank, thank you so much, and thank you for all the great work that you're doing all, on all this. Uh, I'll add one more layer, by the way, which is that in addition to whatever governing documents or, or other kinds of documents there are out there that express how a particular fund should or shouldn't be used, there's also various kind of city, inter city attorney interpretations that have occurred over sometimes decades in terms of various funds and what the permissible uses are. And I think some of those may bear actually uh, – uh, revisiting. Uh, there are actually uh, uh, two special fund uh, audits uh, among a variety of different audits that we're working on right now and just about to complete, uh, which actually have an overlay of, of what interpretations have been uh, in terms of what was or was not permissible and uh, perhaps there may be opportunity to be a little bit more expansive in understanding how that money could, could be used. Well, and I think it's important in, in, in saying how that money can be used um, oftentimes, again, every time we have, uh, or from what I've seen, a special fund report comes out of some type, uh, whether it's the media or the general public or the, the interpretation out there is a quick sound bite to see. They're sitting on all of these funds. Um, they didn't even know about it. Well, the fact is we've known we've had uh, all of these special funds. We've certainly known what the fund balances are. Those reports do come in regularly. It's just not ever been in this level of detail uh, that's trackable. Where this helps, quite frankly, is not to suggest that we had no idea. Everybody's known we've, the number of funds we've had and, and what's out there. Uh, but there's never been a detail where we can actually drill down into each particular one to say what was the legal, not the intended, but the legal use is the critical part of this. Because just because we have the funds, there was some either legal lawsuit or governing document or legislative history that collected those funds, whether they were through... Uh, mitigation money, contributions, settlements uh, that specified uh, how we can and, and specified how we can't legally use those for anything but that purpose. But this is what ties that together so we can drill down into each one of those and see what the governing legislation was or the origin of the fund and that what set up the parameters and the restrictions and conditions of use, which is critically important. We haven't had that ability to do that. And that brings it all together. So I, I applaud your, your efforts and truly appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Mr. Blumenfield. 
Um, certainly, I want to echo the sentiment of my colleagues in, in expressing appreciation for you bringing this all together. It's a Herculean effort and uh, part and parcel of, of the good work that you're doing in the controller's office. Um, you, you mentioned the interest issues, and that, that interested me, to use the word in a different way. Uh, <coughs> the interest interested you. <laughs> yes. How, how, that all, how that all plays out, because some of these, a lot of this is accounting, right? I mean, some of these funds exist within our city accounts and are collecting interest per any other city fund at a certain rate that's dictated by our investments. And then some of these may be in, in within agencies that are, are have different rules around interest in terms of who gets the interest uh, and how that interest is spent. <coughs> uh, and particularly over time, that's really <coughs> convoluted in terms of where that goes. In some ways, I could see it actually, we may have some liabilities here with special funds that that the interest is allowed to accrue to the specialized uh, function, and we've probably been been uh, using that interest in the general fund. Uh, is that is that true? And maybe if you could just help me understand how the interest is working a little bit better. I'm actually going to uh, to have Wei Lao address that because she's gotten very deep into the issue of, okay. uh, of interest. When it comes to interest earning, what our report shows is on attachment G. There are several funds where the department reported where they thought the interest was going, and the Office of Finance has uh, a difference in their record. So we're asking that that review be done to clean up where it should be going. For the most part, if you're talking about a special fund, such as a grant fund, interest usually belongs to the grant, especially for the federal money. If you're talking about gas tax, there's interest that goes to gas tax. And when you look at your budgetary documents, it will show for your special funds, especially on budget, if interest is going to that fund or not. It has a separate line item where an estimate is done on the interest calculation for that year and the actuals for the previous years. So, for example, if it was a federal funding yes. or something, that money, is it, did it actually, do we actually draw it down from the feds or is it, is it an accounting issue that we have with the feds? So, for example, if you take federal money like block grant money, CDBG, there's probably very little interest on our books because we have to draw down and spend, is it within 24 hours or 72 hours? So we're not holding that money. We calculate what we need, we do a drawdown, and that money needs to go back out. But if you have a grant and, where... And if we don't, and I don't mean to interrupt, just, just to, on the okay. line, if we don't do it uh, by a certain time, we may still have it in our accounting as a fund, but the feds are never going to give it to us. If you don't do it and the money sits in that special fund, the interest is earned on that money that's in the special fund and it stays in the special fund. The feds can take <coughs> exception to it when they audit you to say, why did you draw down $30 million that week when you only needed 20 You should have drawn down less because you're not supposed to increase the federal debt ceiling by drawing this money down when you don't think you need it yet. So departments like CDD and Housing, who's had a number of experienced staff, they know how much they need to make payroll and some of the other um, special appropriation costs that they get on a weekly or monthly basis, and they get pretty close to that number because we don't want to be dinged in an audit. So in the case of the federal money, we're, we're assuming that this is money that we could draw down from the feds, even if it's 10 years old. The interest sitting with the city? Because we wouldn't be allowed to keep money that's 10 years old on the federal money. That was my concern, is that it's not, it's not really there. It's the, there's, no real federal, there's no real fund of federal money that we may have an accounting because mm -hmm. we, right. had a, we, we set up a fund to draw down federal money and we were supposed to take it down. We didn't over a certain period of time. In our books, it still looks like we can get it, so it looks like it exists. But in practicality, we're never going to get that money. Well, you have an allocation that you're allowed on an annual basis. And in theory, you're supposed to spend it up to, is it still 1.5% on the block grant side? And if you don't, which the city was in trouble for over 10 years ago, is to meet that you cannot exceed 1.5 of your allocated amount. And if, you, and if we get to where we're spending less than we should, they can very well say, hey, maybe you don't need this money. You're not spending it fast enough. Okay. I guess... Maybe I don't, I don't fully understand then the, some of the special funds of how they're, how right. they're accounted for. So we find an old fund, old paper fund, paper trail of money, and you're saying that could be federal money, it could be state money, it could be 
It could uh, be assessments. Assessments. Um, in the <coughs> assessments, it would have come into, I mean, we would have collected that money. Yes. yes. And it would be sitting in a, in a city, it would be part of the overall city investment portfolio, right? Yes. Uh, so the city would, would theoretically have, have that money in its coffers and earning uh, the interest. general, the, the interest that we earn on all right. the rest of the funding. That's and, what, and, that's and then finance divides it up when the money, the interest earnings come in about which fund gets how much of that investment. So in that case, that would be the liabilities. That's what I was worried about too, is that mm -hmm. in that case, we've been collecting interest as all of our city funds, but there's a special, there's a special fund that we can only spend that money on and only spend that interest on. So in, in essence, that's a liability for the city, isn't it? Well, you put it back into that fund. You, in the, it, if you look at that fund, you will see a cash balance and you will see an interest earning line. And it will show the interest going back into that fund. So we were audited, we can demonstrate, yes, we did not take the interest from that special fund. It's in the fund and we're going to spend it for the purpose of the fund. But th that affects our cash position as a city, right? It's part of your total cash in the city, yes. So that's, I'm looking at that as a lie, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that seems like a liability for the city's cash position and general fund. And then, so that's assessments, and then we have other monies. Or how would you break down the special funds in terms of federal, state, assessments? Is uh, there fines, fees. We I mean, have is, fines is there, and is fees. Is there any sense of the percentages of, of how that works? <sighs> We actually have loaded a lot of that into uh, Socrata, and we can give you sort of a breakdown of uh, that which is attributable to, uh, let's say, federal grants versus other types of grants versus uh, and certain kinds of fees or, or, uh, um, or fines, et cetera, that go into a particular kind of uh, uh, special fund. I think what it is that you were expressing is that the issue of interest can kind of cut both ways. Uh, there are both uh, examples, no doubt, where interest is supposed to be uh, coming to the uh, general fund and to be reimbursed to us in some fashion. That does not happen, but then there are other examples which create the potential, as you mentioned, for, for liability where we're, let's say, getting that interest and not putting it back into the, uh, into the uh, uh, special fund. Although for the most part, I believe that interest is staying with those special funds. Yes. Well, you're doing a lot, of, a lot on this, and I look forward to drilling down a little bit more on this and getting a better understanding of, of where, where it's all going, because there's a lot of special funds. I guess one last question. Have you done any comparisons with other municipalities in terms of how we stack in terms of our special funds? Obviously, I, I don't know too many cities that have done this, this amount of work, but, um, you know, is this, are we in line pretty much with the way other cities are, or we, do we tend to have more special funds in I actually haven't done any kind of analysis in terms of the number of special funds that we have versus others. Uh, many of the ones that we have are, are legally required, and so uh, whatever it is that, that it may be number-wise, we, we're doing it because it's legally required. Um, having said that, what would be extremely helpful and extremely advisable is some really good grants management uh, software. And, and, and really a, a plan to, to execute that on an ongoing and regular basis. And then we could much better judge how we are doing compared to other jurisdictions when it comes to getting those grants. But, but I think in general, you know, two-thirds of our budget is general fund and one-third is generally special funds. If you, if you look at just up the street at the county, it's the other way around. Two-thirds is special funds and only a third is general fund. And, they have obviously a much more complicated stream of funding sources. Uh, if you compare us to other large juris jurisdictions like Chicago or New York, San Francisco, where they operate as both counties and cities in some cases, and they, they would have a greater number. So we're sort of an anomaly as a big city because we, um, uh, you know, we're, our, our structure is more consistent with other smaller cities than they are with national big cities due to our level of responsibilities, but that, that's something to look into. <clears throat> All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that comprehensive report and your continuing good work on this, Mr. Galperin. Thank you, Mr. Santana. Uh, thank you. The recommendations uh, in the report 
members. There are six recommendations from the CAO. Uh, the only suggestion I would have uh, to s slightly modify those is in the, the first recommendation, um, the uh, request to report to the Office of the Controller, I would merely add uh, that uh, that report also go to the CAO the, and the CLA and this committee. Other than that, um, the recommendations that are stated in the in the report. Thank you so very much. And my thanks again to uh, the CAO, also to uh, Wei Lau, and also to uh, Kyle Hall of our office for uh, manning the computer. Thank you very Thank much. You. So, members, if there's no objection to the recommendations I'm as at number four. modified, but what is it? I'm just looking at number four, trying to get an understanding on it. Do we have regular intervals of review on this then now? Is that going to be part of this? I'm sorry, I'm trying to look for that in the recommendations. Most, all, all of these other than that appear to be a one time only uh, kind of proposition, but you're right that, that, that number four is a regular, it seems to suggest a regular going forward reporting requirement. It, it suggests that I'm, 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 I don't know if it's too premature at this point to look at any other suggestions perhaps in reviewing these and all the work that's gone into it and no longer refer to these, quite frankly, as off budget, but very much part of this budget and finance committee meeting. So if we had a regular annual, uh, at a minimum, um, report that's generated that comes back to this committee, and then it's no longer technically off budget. It's very much part of the budget discussions or deliberations throughout the year of special funds. I, I, I think it's I'm well worth how to tie that in. Well, it's, we're just a few weeks away from diving in uh, on our that? budget. Maybe the um, proper time to look at that going forward would be in the context of next year's budget. That's what I was thinking. And, uh, we can provide instructions for reports back in that context to do that. that. And do we want to suggest that it become <coughs> formally, and I, I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time or maybe it is, um, formally that there be a book generated as part of the budget presentation and, and deliberations as a, um, uh, of all the special funds to come back regularly as part of that process? So it's no longer off budget, but very much on budget. Well, and um, I mean, we should, we certainly should, and I think uh, recommendation number five does instruct the departments to work with the CAO to evaluate whether some mm -hmm. particular special funds should be part of the budget process. But I think you're thinking more comprehensively to have some funds. kind of, yeah. Um, not necessarily. Since I, since I don't want to try to figure that out on the fly, yeah, if, I. I think it's a good discussion to have that we could have in the context of a budget report um, if we're going if we're okay with moving forward with these recommendations now let's work uh, at the time that we consider next year's budget uh, and on a framework for doing that because I, I agree with you having even the phrase off budget chafes uh, a little bit because it's not I mean it's all there um, and we really need to uh, to enhance the work that the controller is, has done by bringing it into the budget process, I think, and have that extra level of transparency as well. So, so uh, if there's no objection, we'll go ahead and approve the recommendations as amended. And uh, let's see, I think we're going to go ahead next and go to, I think we have a lot of people here on item number 12, so without objection, members, we're going to go out of order to number 12 next. <clears throat> and why don't we hear a uh, staff report on this first before we go to public comment. Item number 12. Item number 12 is a motion, Weston City or Martinez, relative to appropriating funds to the Department of Housing and Community Investment for the purpose of funding various programs for the three-month period of April 1, 2014 through June 30, 2014. Uh, the Housing Committee waived the consideration of this matter. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
Ivania Salbaro with the Chief Legislative Analyst Office. Before you is Council Motion West and Cedillo Martinez requesting approximately $1.9 million for a three month period from April 1st, 2014 to June 30th, 2014 for various projects that unfortunately at this time are not being recommended for funding within the consolidated plan. Um, as you may recall, we were here in February. Uh, describing the letter that was recently received from HUD indicating that the way that the city was um, funding its community-based or CBDO uh, programs was uh, not in compliance and we would have to fix that. So as a result we've been looking at that and um, unfortunately, we have got in our public services category, which is capped at 15%, we've had to go from approximately $37.5 million in public services to funding uh, approximately $16 million. So that is why we're here with this motion uh, to uh, propose uh, three months funding again for the, for the agency that, that you see listed there for approximately $1.9 um, with the understanding that the department, uh, housing is here I think as well, uh, will have to come back with a long-term plan for how we're going to deal with some of these agencies and programs in the future. Okay. Um, any initial questions before we go to public comment? Mr. Blumenfield. Yeah. So when we, um, and I've, I, I think it's critically important programs that we got to figure out a way to fund and, and I'm all for that. Um, of course, don't like the fact that, that we're in this predicament. But assuming that the 1.9 million, and for that matter, the remainder for the next year, we can't, we can no longer fund it out of CDBG money. That means that there is that much additional money that's left in, in our CDBG block grant that's unallocated. Is that right? There is no funds unallocated well, uh, in the we're saying consolidated that, plan. No, we're we're saying that CDBG basically. The feds have told us that we cannot, that we're short 1.9 million because we um, were previously spending it per, we were per, as the CDBO program, right? And so now we're, we're saying, well, we can't do that, so we have to make up for that shortfall fall somewhere. But that also means that there is, of the, of the big block grant, that that money is now unspent in the block grant. Uh, the funds that, that were on, that there are no unspent funds, they've all been allocated to other projects in the consolidated plan other categories well, so but when, when, when did that if if there was if it was a hundred bucks and then we were told five dollars we can no longer can no longer be used for this purpose which is what I understand that's why the general fund has to make up that difference that with the money we were previously allocating to that how did it just all all of a sudden get spent on other things where where is that now uh, and, Council and, and the reason why I'm asking this okay. is to try to figure out if there's some sort of a swap that we could do with general funds so that we could make sure we take care of these critical programs but that we also uh, don't end up spending more general fund. That's where, that's where I'm leading to and, I, and to get to that point I'm trying to understand where, where the money went that we right. no longer spent. The, in the category of for public services, the 15 point the 15 million was actually allocated to all our to our AIDS programs, our age, our homeless programs, um, the loss of programs, the domestic violence program. So that's where the 15 million went. Um, we also have a balance there that needs to be covered by the general fund. The other funds that where you say we did have enough funds in the category, we put more money in capital projects because those pro that category is not capped. So we did look at capital projects that were in the city where we could, that could be funded with CDBG. So, so when, when the, the, the money moved from the CDBO programs to capital? Yes. And now that's why we have to make, make it up. Now, the capital part that was moved to, yes. um, that's something that general fund could spend as well? Uh, yes, some of the projects there could be supplemented with CDBG. So is there a way to sort of do a, to do a swap so that we don't lose on the general fund? Yes. Okay. Okay. Mr. Anderson, Mr. Kress? Okay. You're good. You're good? No. Mr. Kress? Good. All right. Uh, thank you very much. So we have a lot of cards on this. So, um, I'm going to 
call members up three at a, uh, call members of the public up three at a time. Uh, we'll start with uh, Mario Rivera and Raul Salinas and Martha is it Evalo? Uh, no, e Ave Arevalo. I'm sorry, Arevalo. <coughs> Mr. Rivera, welcome. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Mario Rivera. Oh, Benito. Uh, <coughs> Do we uh, have anyone who could translate? I will translate. Please. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Mario Rivera y yo soy aquí en representación de mis compañeros. Este, soy jornalero por 15 años en el centro de downtown y vengo de esperar um, good afternoon my name is Mario Rivera I'm a day laborer uh, the East Congregate and Downtown Center now on behalf of my uh, co-workers and friends day laborers uh, vengo aquí porque nos cerraron el centro y ahora estamos en esquina y vengo a pedirles a suplicarles que nos encuentren una ayuda porque estamos ahorita en la esquina y, y son muchos problemas los que tenemos en la esquina in the calle, buscando trabajo a diario. I'm here because uh, we closed our center last week, and on behalf of my uh, co-workers and myself, I want to ask for your support to keep my labor center open. Uh, ahorita estoy tomando clases de, de salud, de promotor de salud. Nos dan varias clases ahí en ese centro. Uh, cuando no trabajamos, nos ocupamos en que nos dan clases de inglés, de computadora, nos, nos dan varias clases ahí. Es when, todo, gracias. When I'm not, not working, I used to get a computer classes, ESO classes, and right now I'm taking uh, as health promoter classes. So all this happened at the daily center, now they were closed. Uh, we don't have an opportunity. Please help us out. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Raul Salinas, followed by Martha Arevalo. Uh, buenas tardes, mi nombre es Raúl Salinas, soy jornalero de Downtown Community Job Center, eh, IDESCA, es Instituto de Educación Popular del Sur de California, y vengo al igual que el compañero que habló ahorita a pedirles, a suplicarles, que usted sé que están en un gran problema, ¿verdad? no hayan cómo mandar el dinero para aquí para allá, y están como el lama de casa de la comunidad, ¿verdad? que apenas les alcanza. Un momentito, pero... Uh, my name is, good afternoon, my name is Raul Salinam. I'm also a day laborer from the downtown labor center. And we're facing a lot of problems right now to uh, support our families since we close our center. So I'm here on behalf of myself, on behalf of my uh, co-workers to uh, ask for help. Sé que están en un dilema para dónde mandar el dinero, dónde más se necesita, pero manteniendo los centros de, de trabajo, mantienen la ciudad de Los Ángeles una ciudad fuerte, ¿verdad? Yo, este, estamos en la incertidumbre en estos próximos meses, ¿qué va a pasar si... I know that it's very hard for you to know, uh, right now to uh, actually make a decision to which firm do you need to support, but I, I, I want to let you know that if you support us, you're supporting a city that's going to be stronger, with a stronger economy and a stronger family. Pero le suplicamos que, que cuando llegue su ayuda, que sea seguro que la vamos a tener. Este, se vea, por favor, a, a largo plazo para no vivir en esta incertidumbre que va a pasar después. We are concerned that because we probably will get a three months uh, uh, period for operating, but we know that a long-term solution is it, it is a, is a priority also for the city. So we're asking here to, to, to support the, this problem, but also to look for a long-term uh, solution. Es tanta nuestra desasiego que le he pedido a Dios que nos permita seguir funcionando con nuestro centro, que nos ayude. Pero él me contestó que le dijera primero a ustedes. Me dijo, al César lo que es del César. Y adiós, 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 me dijo. Gracias. I consulted with God, but he, he replied to me that first to ask him, I should ask uh, my, my official representative to, to look for a solution. Thank you. Gracias. 
<laughs> Good okay. afternoon. My name is Marta Revalo. I'm the Executive Director of the Central American Resource Center, CARESEN. Uh, CARESEN has been in existence in, in Los Angeles for 31 years, providing services and programs for the immigrant community. Uh, we have managed one of the day labor centers uh, in the uh, uh, city uh, district number one for 11 years, and we are able to provide immigrant integration programs of ESL classes, computer literacy classes, and other types of, of, of programs um, that help um, our day laborers integrate into society. But the most important part of our work is that we facilitate the hiring process of these workers that provide a great service to the city of Los Angeles. Um, and we have the support of employers um, and our other stakeholders, such as Home Depot and business owners and residents um, in that district and throughout the city for these day labor centers. This is a, a corner that at least our day labor center where unfortunately there have been times where there's a lot of tension in the corner and a day labor center really provides a support for day laborers in making sure that stakeholders are in constant communication, that day laborers are uh, doing other programs such as uh, community cleanups um, and contributing to, to their community. It is really important for the City of Los Angeles to support this three-month uh, extension of our contracts and for other services uh, because LA has been a national model, um, and particularly for day laborers. LA, Los Angeles is a city of inclusion, and these programs for us are um, a true testament of that principle of a city of inclusion that recognizes the contributions of immigrants and immigrant families. So we thank you, uh, uh, the committee, for considering this motion. We thank Council Member Cedillo, Council President Wesson, and Council Member Martinez for introducing this motion. And we really ask you to support this motion and continue to support for our day labor centers and to also help us and work with us uh, to continue to find a permanent solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent timing. Uh, our next speaker is Veronica Fedorovsky, followed by Deborah Su and Nancy Volpert. So you can all come on up. Okay, then we'll bring up uh, Pat Butler. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi, my name is Veronica Fedorovsky. I work with the National Day Labor Organization Network, which is the network of 42 organizations around the country that work for their labor rights. And thanks for the opportunity to speak. And um, I want to share that, as the uh, compañera mentioned, LA has been a model for the rest of the country. I help personally opening day labor centers around the country, as they always come to LA to see how the day labor centers in LA work. And since the city of LA is a city of inclusion for low-income workers, it's really important to keep funding these centers. And I uh, personally, uh, in name of uh, my organization and the day laborers and domestic workers and families that depend on these centers, ask you to please approve the funding for <clears throat> the three months and then while the city works on a long-term solution for this. It would be really sad, not only for Los Angeles, for, but for the rest of the country, if these worker centers close. Everybody's looking out uh, to see what's, what's going to happen in LA, and we're basically providing guidance about uh, what's going to what's happen with the laborers around the country, too. So uh, please uh, don't close the center and keep funding them. Thank you. Ms. Volpert, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Nancy Volpert. I'm Director of Public Policy for Jewish Family Service of Los Angeles. We are celebrating our 160th anniversary as a nonprofit here in LA, and we provide services to vulnerable individuals of all ages across the city. Uh, we're here today particularly to support this motion and express our deep appreciation to the council and mayor's staff for finding a creative way to help support the funding for domestic violence shelter operations. Uh, yes, we are still taking a 10% cut, but given what some of our colleague agencies are funding, um, we do appreciate what you've done, and we look forward to working with Council to find ways to help protect the program that helps protect the safety of women and children in particular who are at risk and who are being threatened with violence in the homes, and this is helping them regain self-sufficiency. And it helps make a stronger Los Angeles. So thank you. Please vote for the motion here and in council, and we look forward to working with you moving forward to find uh, 
restorative funding for some of our other priorities. Thank you. Ms. Butler. Hi, I'm Pat Butler. I'm director of Sojourn Services for Battered Women and Their Children in Santa Monica with a shelter in Los Angeles City. Um, it's, it, as everyone is going to state who's from a shelter, it's incredibly important to continue the funding to victims of domestic violence. You probably know that a woman is murdered every 12 days in LA County, and we don't probably have enough beds for them. But this council and this committee in particular has always been really supportive of the shelters, and we're very grateful that you will continue to protect the money that protects those women and protects their children. Thank you very much. Thank you for your work. Um, okay, our next group, our next group of speakers are Sarah Burdine, Debbie Nelson, and Jorge Robles. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Ms. Burdine. Good afternoon. My name is Debbie Nelson, and I'm a senior director at 1736 Family Crisis Center. 1736 operates shelters for victims of domestic violence and their children who are fleeing life-threatening circumstances in the city of Los Angeles. On behalf of our organization, I want to thank you for allocating general fund dollars to the domestic violence shelter operations. However, we also want to remind you that with both the comp plan dollars and the general fund dollars, we are still not being funded to the previous amount as last year, and we will still suffer a cut. Please know that any cut to all, at all represents dangers to victims of domestic violence. If even one family is not able to maintain a safe roof over their heads, it is a travesty. We have to remember that domestic violence funding has been consistently cut over the years. We respectfully request that you continue to prioritize these life-saving programs and identify additional reliable funding in the general fund to ensure their continuation in this community. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sarah Burdine. I'm the executive director of Haven Hills. We've been serving victims of domestic violence in the San Fernando Valley now for almost 38 years. And I want to thank all of you for the hard work that you've done. And I would tell you, I really, you have such a tremendous job, you know, in deciding with the money that we do have, where should it go? But the process here, I, everything that has been said with the previous domestic violence program, people that have come up here and spoke, I concur with what they're saying. And I want to thank you because I know we have your support and we have the city's support for domestic violence victims. And when we went through the consolidated plan and it went back out to public opinion, again it was supported what the need is great for the domestic violence victims. The women, the children, and the men who face these circumstances need a safe place to go to be able to break that cycle of violence. Um, the Sojourn representative spoke to a, a uh, a statistic that right here in LA County and the city of Los Angeles is a huge part of LA County we have one woman every 12 days that dies that's murdered because of domestic violence so I'm here to ask you to support this motion that's in front of us to continue to keep the domestic violence programs within a consolidated plan and also to support the additional funding even though there is a cut it won't be as severe as what it was looked upon before. And I applaud you for the work that you do and the decisions that you have to make, and I hope that you consider this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Robles. Buenas tardes. Vengo, yo soy del, del puesto de los jornaleros que, que están en downtown y nos quitaron el área, ¿verdad? Y ahí nos juntamos, ahí... Ahí agarramos trabajo, ahí se nos dan clases de, de computación, de inglés, ¿sí? de muchas cosas de teatro de, para la salud. ¿sí? Uh, good afternoon, my name is Jorge Robles, I'm also a day laborer from the downtown community Yap Center. Uh, we close our center and now we are on the street. We used to have a lot of different problems and now that we're on the street we are um, suffering. Y, Le estamos pidiendo la ayuda de ustedes para, bueno, más bien de ustedes, señor Paul, para que 
se nos, dé, se nos abre otra vez el lugar para, para poder subsistir, porque es el dinero que necesitamos para la familia, para mantener la familia, para, ¿verdad? No nomás estamos solos, necesitamos, dependemos de gente, ¿verdad? Que está al pendiente de nosotros y necesitamos la ayuda de ustedes, por favor. So, I'm here to ask you for support in, in, in support the motion that is in, uh, today in the agenda, because in that way we can open up the center again and we can provide for our families. Es todo, gracias. Thank you so much. Uh, and our final two speakers on this matter are Alfredo Vidal and Luis Perez. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Vidal. Uh, good afternoon, um, gentlemen. Well, I belong to the Day Labor Center in, um, in Union in, um, in Wilshire, and uh, I think it would be a, a great mistake to close the centers down. There's a lot of members of the community, and um, they they're benefit from the center. As, um, I live in the community, so I know, so I'm, so I'm familiarized with the, with, the whole, with the entire area, and a lot of people that I, that, I, that I know that live in the community go gather up in the center to, um, to look for work. So they could bring some food to the uh, food to the table for their families, and I think it'll be a, a great mistake of, uh, if the if the center uh, shuts down. And um, last night I sent an angel to protect all you, all you gentlemen in front, and the angel the angel came back a short time later and told me an angel is another, another angel to protect them. So I'm pretty sure you guys want to vote yes on this motion and, uh, and remain our center open. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Bueno, soy Alfredo Vidal. Eh, venimos eh, a, 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 pues a pedir por el centro para que para que nos den el, el, el presupuesto, ese dinero que, ¿verdad? Hi, my name is Alfredo Vidal, and I'm here to ask for um, funding for our center. Eh, I hope, I hope that you can consider to maintain our day labor center open um, if it's not too much to ask. Because without the day labor center, there's chaos. Um, there's, there tends to be a lot of human rights violations and a lot of um, tickets given out by police, of, by police officers if the center would not be there. Um, so it's up to you to make that decision. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, members, uh, any other questions for staff on this? Or? All right, then uh, the recommendation is to approve uh, the item and move, it, move this uh, solution forward. To oh, it, and I'm sorry, it, it is going to be approved with a slight modification. As uh, I, yes, the I'll, just give, uh, I'll just give the general. The motion um, has the money transferring to the housing department, but then there are a number of departments that would receive the funding, so we would just request that the, um, that the recommendations be amended to allow the allocation of the funds to the correct departments. Okay, and you have that list yeah. of departments? Yeah, and we can provide the, the wording to the city clerk. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it won't change the impact. It's no. merely to direct the funds to the appropriate department rather than having it all go down. Right, and who, and who prepares the controller instructions. Okay. All right. Uh, any objections, members? To, all right, okay. seeing no objections, uh, the motion carries, and it will advance to council. Thank you all very much for coming down. <laughs> and, and thank you all for working on a solution to a very, very difficult problem that was handed to us by the federal government. So thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, that's, and as everyone is uh, exiting, let's go ahead and call number 11.
Item 11 is an Office of Finance report relative to a summary of the 2013 tax penalty amnesty program, including revenue generated and program costs. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Council Members. Um, Ed Cabrera, Office of Finance. I'm here to report on the 2013 tax penalty amnesty program. As part of finance's uh, fiscal year 13-14 budget, we had proposed a tax penalty amnesty program. The intent of the program uh, was to provide relief to distressed businesses that are still suffering from the economic crisis as it so slowly recovers. Um, the program was approved by the council and the mayor for the fiscal year 13-14 budget. The program uh, generated over $24.3 million in uh, revenue collected, including 900000 from installment payment agreements. Over 9,200 businesses participated in the program, and the program was available to businesses that had delinquent taxes related to either business taxes, the utility users' taxes, including gas, electricity, um, as well as communications users' taxes, also the occupancy taxes such as uh, parking occupancy tax, transit, transient op occupancy tax, and the tenant uh, uh, commercial tenant occupancy tax. Approximately $10.1 million in penalties were waived as part of the program. Uh, we did uh, identify 140 new businesses um, that were not registered. So the uh, uh, hope is that as these businesses progress and develop within the city, that additional revenue will be uh, coming forward to the city. The program was extensively um, uh, advertised through a variety of media. Uh, the program also uh, came in under budget, uh, only approximately 140000 of the 320000 that was budgeted to finance was used, and we do credit the uh, extensive service of the finance employees um, for the success of the program as well as the uh, outreach of the program. Well, congratulations. This is just a tremendous success on every level. It's more revenue. Uh, for the city. Uh, it gives um, some comfort to businesses that have been struggling and it provides a base of new businesses that will hopefully be in compliance from, from now on. So you know, for the cost of $10 million in penalty waivers to realize $24 million in revenues is a pretty good return on investment. Uh, we agree. Four times more than what was budgeted. So it's a, a tremendous success and I want to congratulate you. Mr. Englander. Yeah, we should we should do that for crime. So if you turn yourself in, you've committed a crime. Maybe that won't work. Um, so this was it was expected to be at six million dollars. Just let me get these numbers down. And um, it costs well, it didn't cost us anything. It cost it cost money to put the program on. How much did it cost? To put the program on? Uh, the uh, budget was three hundred twenty thousand, and we expended one hundred and thirty nine thousand, uh, and that was primarily for outreach advertising. Um, and uh, a small amount of additional uh, temporary employees that we use to uh, support uh, the program. The uh, uh, regular employees uh, and, and the funding for those regular employees, um, we did not receive anything additional, so that did come out of our regular uh, budget allocation. So you spent half of what you anticipated spending? Uh, a little bit less than half, about correct. About 130 grand. Correct, and out of 320,000. Um, you identified, um, well, it was, it was, the goal was $6 million to try to get back, hopefully $6 million. Um, you, we waived $10 million in penalties, and we got $24 million in additional revenue from businesses under the program. Now, and those will be ongoing, as Mr. Kikorian said, each and every year. So it's not just one time. You spent one time money of $130,000. It was one time waiving of $10 million. We got $24 million, and then that will be ongoing. That, that's 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 a uh, pretty remarkable. With with that, how many how many of these uh, did we also waive the ones that were under the city's tax holiday of a hundred thousand or less to get them to sign up as well? Well, those businesses, if, if uh, they there had to be a liability for them to participate, mm -hmm. so there were uh, delinquent ta taxes that uh, were under consideration, um, but businesses that uh, are eligible for any of our uh, 
uh, incentives, for example, the tax holiday or the small business. Uh, normally, for example, in the tax holiday, for their first three years, they would not owe any tax, assuming that they came forward. Right. But if there were uh, liabilities for businesses that were new, those were forgiven. So some of those businesses uh, that could qualify um, would certainly be available in future years for some type of incentive. Sure. So, so uh, I guess my question is, did we uncover or did anybody step forward, because it was really a step forward program, um, in applying for a business license that had previously not paid any business tax, although they would have been exempt under the $100,000 rule um, if they filed on time. Had they not, they would have incurred a penalty. Correct. Even though they wouldn't have a liability necessarily uh, because they fell under that $100,000 gross. Were any of these companies identified, and did they come forward that fell under that hundred thousand dollars threshold in this? Uh, as, as far as whether they fell under the threshold or not, uh, we haven't identified that yet. We can certainly look at it. But there were 140 new businesses um, that had not been registered uh, with us previously, so some of those considerably uh, could qualify could have qualified for the small business or new business exemption. We would have to go back and take a look and see. Those are just ones now we're getting on the books that necessarily might not be part of that 24 million that just came in, uh, but also will be uh, identified as, as as businesses in the city um, for future years as well. So. Correct. Terrific. Excellent. Thank you. Great work, by the way. Thank you. Pretty phenomenal. Mr. Blumenfield. Um, again, I want to echo. Excited about obviously whenever the city gets revenues and we're able to do that. That's, that's a wonderful thing. A uh, couple of questions though on the um, we're talking about ongoing revenue that this will create ongoing revenue. Is there is there any potential loss of revenue for next year in terms of the penalties that have been waived and that and that kind of thing where we had expectations for money but because we've done this we'll get slightly less in the immediate year. There's a possibility um, some of the revenue that we uh, collected conceivably we, we would have collected uh, as we go forward in terms of our collection efforts. Um, so there is a possibility that revenue that we did realize uh, we would have realized through collection efforts down the road. But again, that would uh, require extensive uh, collection efforts on behalf of not only the Office of Finance, but considerably also the City Attorney's Office. But one thing I, I do need to, to clarify, as far as ongoing revenue, this is one-time revenue that was delinquent. Ongoing revenue would uh, pertain to businesses that we identified that participated in the program that were not previously registered. Um, so this was uh, revenue that was one time, um, and it was based on uh, delinquent uh, uh, assessments that had been issued and revenue that was due to the city. So um, it, that was built into the uh, budget, and uh, as indicated, we did far exceed what was budgeted. Okay, so it's not really the, it's not really an ongoing revenue, except in the rare. In the, is it a small percentage of those that were identifying new businesses? Yes, 140 out of the uh, 90, over 9,200 that participated. Okay, so that's relatively easy. The other thing that seems slightly anomalous is in the different categories you had the, the TOT, the transit oriented tax, I mean the um, hotel tax. The penalties were pretty close to the revenues. What was the, the reason for that? Uh, there were a couple of large uh, uh, liabilities, uh, which, uh, again, accompanied by the uh, more than likely 40 percent uh, full application of penalty that was applicable. So there were a couple of large participants that, uh, part, that took part in the program. Um, so that uh, accounted for the uh, uh, small uh, disparity between the revenue that was uh, generated versus the penalties that were waived. In terms of the overall revenue, was it, was it uh, maybe this is in there, um, did most of it come from a few main folks or was it really distributed evenly? Uh, for the business tax, it was pretty much distributed evenly. Um, we did receive a variety of payments from over the, you know, the 9,200 that did participate. Um, so for the business tax, which was the, uh, the main component, almost 18 million was collected. Uh, from business tax that was uh, spread over uh, the various participants. But the TOT was? TOT was the exception, was a correct. Couple of, of how, many, how many were in that one? That uh, total, there were uh, 61 businesses that uh, participated in the amnesty that uh, had TOT liabilities that were delinquent, as opposed to the business tax, uh, over 9,000 uh, participated in the amnesty. And then was there any 
in terms of top offenders, we, did we limit them in any way, or would pretty much anybody come one, come all? Uh, they were they were all eligible to participate, provided that they filed an application. They also were required to pay the full uh, principal interest and any collection fees. But uh, in terms of any other uh, restrictions, uh, no, they were all eligible to participate as long as there was a delinquent tax and they did uh, um, meet the criteria of the ordinance. And, and prior to this, when was the last time we did something like this? We had a the city ha offered a tax uh, penalty amnesty in 2009. And I would point out in 2009, it had been eight years since the prior amnesty in 2001. The 2009 amnesty program uh, generated 20.6 million. Um, so the current amnesty was uh, overwhelming success. Um, one of the reasons for the uh, projection of 5.5 uh, million in terms of uh, the anticipated program was the fact that the uh, this program was uh, compressed since only four years since the prior amnesty, as well as the harsh economic climate. So it was a tremendous success overall. I guess it's always tricky how you time these things, because if people know when they're going to happen, then you're going to have that effect where people are waiting for the amnesty. Did we see any of that on this one? No, no, uh, not at all. I mean, I, I don't think that there had been any uh, type of signal that uh, the city was anticipating offering an amnesty program. So I don't believe that uh, there was uh, uh, any type of uh, action by um, uh, taxpayers to withhold payment. I believe that the, most of the delinquencies were truly due to financial distress uh, caused by the economic crisis. Great. Well, again, congratulations on, on the success. Thank you, and we thank uh, the uh, council members for their support as well, as well as the mayor's office. Mr. Kretz? Uh, nothing else. It's, it's a great job and a huge success, so I just commend you like everyone else. So, um, actually, I wanted to ask, uh, this is more directed to the CAO as to how we uh, budget this amount now. So, um, we're going to have... Uh, almost $20 million in uh, revenues above what, what was budgeted for this year as a result of this program, right? Well, 18 million. Well, we, we're projecting, uh, um, we have taken a look at where we are as far as business tax. Uh, and uh, uh, based on the collections to date, uh, we are still projecting that uh, we will uh, end up roughly around uh, $463 million. Um, give or take two to three million either way. So we're project projecting a range as far as business tax uh, collections that are realized for this fiscal year of approximately 460 to 465 million. And that does include the uh, revenue that was uh, uh, obtained through amnesty. Oh, okay. So in order to meet the budgeted revenue projection for the business tax right now, you're already incorporating the extra revenues that come from the amnesty. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, very good. Well, if there's nothing uh, further, members, we'll uh, note and file this report with our thanks and congratulations. Good work. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. That brings us to uh, item number 14, I think. Yeah. Item number 14. Number 14 is a city administrative officer report relative to approval of the selection of the city's general financial advisors financial advisors for the city's wastewater systems revenue bonds program and financial advisors for the city's various debt programs. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Natalie Burrell, CEO's office. This report is really for three separate engagements. One is for the city's general financial advisor. The second is for the financial advisor for the wastewater system. And the third is for a qualified list of financial advisors to help us on transactions when we do all the other debt programs of the city. Uh, we went through a process of releasing an RFP for general financial advisor and for wastewater financial advisor and an RFQ for a qualified list of financial advisors. Uh, we had on our panel not only four members of the CAO's debt management team, but also three members of the proprietary departments, one from the water and power, one from uh, the Port of Los Angeles, and one from the airport. Uh, our recommendations um, 
basically are to establish a list of 13 firms uh, to help us with our transactions. For the wastewater program, we are recommending that we have two financial advisors, uh, Public Resources Advisory Group and Frasca and Associates, and two co-financial advisors, k and Public Finance and Montague DeRose and Associates. For general financial advisor, um, when we began the process three years ago, uh, before this expired, we had four, and two of the firms disappeared. They One became... Um, was bought out and became an underwriter, and the other one became the CFO of the city of Chicago. So we were down to two. We really feel that four is a good number for our general financial advisors. It gives the city a broad level of expertise that we can draw on on all the different issues dealing with the finances of the city, not only with the debt management program. And those four would be Public Resources Advisory Group, k and Public Finance, Montague, DeRose, and Associates, and Omnicap Group. So those are basically the recommendations we have for this process. Okay. Um, on the second page of the report, mm -hmm. uh, it, it indicates um, that uh, the $3 million over the three-year period is, are primarily from bond proceeds. So they're Correct. Is it primarily or exclusively? Are there other sources of those uh, funds? Sometimes there's a special request that we receive to look at something, and we have uh, money set aside in the Capital Finance Administration Fund, which is a general fund, funded fund, um, and sometimes we take money from there, depending on what the issue is. If it's a special fund issue or a bond issue, we can take it from those funds, but if it's something dealing with the general fund, we'd have to take it from uh, cap finance. But is your correct primarily from bond funds? Okay. Um, bef before we go to questions, I do have one card. So let me uh, take the public speaker, and then we might come back at you. So um, I have one card from Brian Whitworth. Mr. Whitworth, That's welcome. Me, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm uh, Brian Whitworth from First Southwest Company. We're one of the largest financial advisors in the United States and the largest financial advisor to cities, including many of the largest cities uh, in the U.S. and in California. Um, we've included in your materials a letter from the CAO uh, stating for the RFP and RFQ under consideration that uh, we were not eligible to be scored. Um, there is a unique first-time uh, new policy that's been instituted here uh, by the CAO's office as to who is eligible. Um, and uh, it asks that any firm bidding agree not to underwrite any bonds for any other issuer in California, so the state, other cities, etc. cetera. Um, we do not uh, wish to get rid of our underwriting clients, and uh, we don't regard this uh, as a conflict which cannot be overcome. Um, the city already has financial policies that state uh, what you can do if you are a firm that also underwrites. Um, we are willing to serve under those um, circumstances. Uh, I also remind the board that uh, the city's financial policies and administrative code both say that there should be uh, a fair and open selection process, which provides opportunities for all firms. Uh, the California Public Contract Code similarly says that uh, you should provide all bidders with a fair opportunity to enter the bidding process. And the City Council has previously asked the CAO on financial advisor RFPs to encourage as many firms as possible to respond. So we believe we are qualified, and we ask the committee to direct the CAO to score for South responses, uh, our firm's responses on the same basis as other firms, and report back to the committee. We believe the Council should ultimately set the policy regarding who may propose and what rules and roles they may serve under. Thank you. Thank you. Members, questions on this? Mr. Kretz? Uh, I wonder if we could get a response from the CAO on whether that is a viable uh, possibility. Thanks, Good afternoon. Um, the policy that we've had in place has existed for many, many years, and what that policy does initially 
basically uh, prohibited any FA from engaging in any kind of underwriting activity, period. And so uh, we tried to be a little bit more inclusive this time by limiting that prohibition to California underwriting only. So if you do underwriting work in Texas or another part of the country, then we would not see that as a conflict. The reason why we see it as a conflict is, is because we, um, it's difficult. We see it uh, challenging for a financial advisor to, on one hand, provide the best advice to the city and at the same time engage in other underwriting activities in, in, a, in an other area where, there, where they may have an interest in particular bonds that are out and in direct competition with the city. And so we've maintained uh, a consistent approach when it comes to this issue. It predates my arriving to the, to the city. Um, but in an effort to try to be a little bit more inclusive, we, we limited sort of that, that expectation to California only. This is an issue that's being debated at a national level, um, and there's sort of evolving regulation when it comes to potential conflicts that financial advisors engage in. Uh, all other financial advisors were uh, responsive as it relates to this question, and uh, the work that we did was in accordance to advice that we received from the city attorney's office, and certainly uh, Noreen is here to be more specific, but at the end of the day, the city is the client, and the client has a right to set whatever standards we feel are appropriate to ensure a minimum amount of conflict. How, how practical is it that this conflict ever actually comes up? Is this, is this a real possibility, or are we being overly cautious? Well, it's, it's, in, if it's a big enough uh, issue in general that there's a larger conversation taking place on a national level about how to sort this out. And so um, our colleagues around the country are, are uh, looking at their various uh, policies as relates to this potential issue of conflict. And so we've, we've maintained a consistent approach for many, many years and we're continuing that uh, while at the same time uh, ensuring that we have a, a, a good number of financial advisors. We actually will be having more financial advisors under this RFP than we currently have today in practice. So uh, the city did not limit its options by establishing this rule. Uh, I guess one more question. What, how far will we watch the discussion nationally? Are we likely to look for a consensus and move in that same direction? And the, in what direction is that moving in? The direction is moving closer to the direction that the city has taken. So it's, it's, a, it's a more uh, conservative direction than a more liberal one. It, it, by what national standards are conflicts in this arena judged? Is there some code of conduct or... A code of professional standards of some kind, I and mean, when you say the ha discussion is happening on a national level, in in what milieu? Well, both in uh, the MSRB as well as um, the Security Exchange Commission, the, those Congress has has actually debated this issue oh. as well. So it's a it's on a it's at a in various forms and in, in various arenas where we're regulated, and so. Um, the MSRB was recently supposed to come out with further clarity on this issue and uh, hasn't fully released it because they haven't resolved all of the issues. Natalie, perhaps you could give further clarity. Yeah, the, the SEC released a rule on municipal advisor and what that means and registering municipal advisors. And we acknowledge that that basic rule says that an underwriter and a financial advisor, an underwriter cannot be on both sides of the transaction. They can't be an underwriter as well as a financial advisor on the same deal. Um, the city of LA is a frequent issuer, which means we're in the market quite a bit. And our concern has always been that um, if we go out and we're in, say, competition, but we're in the market at the same time as other players in California, to have a financial advisor be on our team and that same underwriter be an underwriter somewhere else, we feel that it could possibly be a conflict. Um, and that's the policy which has been in place since 2005 clearly says that we have a right to use underwriters 
as financial advisors when we feel it's appropriate. And in the past, we have. You know, we used them for the parking um, P3 deal. We used them when we were looking at Ontario. We had an underwriter as part of the team as a FA. It's not that we don't need them. It's that we have a whole separate list of underwriters in which we are able to take if we need a financial advisor. But for our normal day-to-day -day work, we feel it's in the best interest to have an independent financial advisor who has no interest in the underwriting side and what actually happens to our bonds. We're a little bit more conservative than the rest of the market, but I think um, because we are a frequent issuer, it protects the city and gets the best advice that we can. Okay. Thank you. We usually don't do back and forth, Mr. Whitworth, uh, especially in a situation like this. Uh, but uh, thank you for coming down and for your materials. Uh, members, any other questions on this? All right. Um, then if there is there any objection to approving the CAO's recommendations? Yeah, I'll make the recommendation to approve. Rep okay. Uh, so without objection, it will be the action of the committee to approve the CAO's recommendations and advances to council. Uh, and I believe that, thank you very much, Mr. Whitworth, for coming down. That brings us to the end of our open session items, I think, if I'm not mistaken. All right. So uh, we will now go into close it. Oh. Before we go into closed session, is there anyone wishing to be heard on the closed session items two and five? Seeing none, uh, comment on those matters is closed. Is there anyone else wishing to be heard in general public comment? General public comment is now closed, and we will retire to, to closed session. Thank on item number two first. So if you're not here on item number two, if you could just step out for a moment, we'll be with you momentarily. All right, uh, members, we are back now in open session, and um, I'd like to propose the following recommendations consistent with uh, the CAO's uh, recommendations regarding uh, item number five. Number one, that we instruct the CAO to coordinate through June 30th, 2014, a citywide response excluding the Departments of Water and Power, Harbor, Airport, Transportation, and Sanitation, identifying locations of damaged sidewalks abutting city, fil city facilities for repair, and to begin implementing those repairs. Number two, to authorize the controller to establish a new appropriation account within the Capital Improvement Expenditure Program, Fund 100, Department 50, uh, as follows sidewalk repair uh, with an account number to be determined. B, transfer $10 million from the unappropriated balance fund number 100 slash 58 and appropriate therefrom to the CIEP fund number 100 slash 50 as follows, account number to be determined, account name, sidewalk repair. C, authorize the city administrative officer to make recommendation for transfer therefrom in a financial status report or construction projects report to implement mayor and council intentions. And recommendation number three, instruct and or request that the departments of water and power, harbor, airport, transportation, and sanitation to survey the sidewalks abutting their respective facilities for damage and perform repairs as needed. And if that's... Uh, 
consistent with the intentions of the committee. Uh, I see no objections. That will be the action of the committee. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>